Good evening, this is Dr. Bernstein with the May 2016 version of our uh, teleseminar. Um, let me give you the usual warning that the answers I give are guesses. Uh, I don't have uh, the full history of a patient. I don't have a physical exam, and I'm not seeing the person who has written the question. So uh, I have, I just have a rudimentary guess at the estimates of the que- at the answer answer to the question. Uh, but uh, these answers are meant for the large group of listeners who are hearing it, and they may learn something, even though. I may not have the adequate answer for the person who asked the question. Now, the special subject for tonight is as follows. Uh, It really is related to this, to an article that was published in the journal Diabetes in 2007. Uh, And the reason I am uh, bringing up this subject is because people keep asking me, what can I do to make my diabetes go away? And usually there's nothing. But from time to time, we stumble on um, uh, a supplement or a chemical or a, a prescription drug that... Uh, may or may not uh, bring back some beta cell function. And here we have an article that says that serum, and I'm quoting, serum levels of L-carnosine are associated with increased beta cell mass. Now this was a study done on rodents, and apparently if they were supplemented with L-carnosine, their beta cell mass increased. So this is something that's worth noting. Um, anybody can try a supplement of L-carnosine, and maybe uh, it will um, help. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I might add that there are other studies that show that L-carnosine inhibits the formation of oxidized LDL, that L-carnosine supposedly can prevent the oxidation of LDL. And we know that oxidized LDL is a risk factor for uh, heart disease. Um, one reason why I bring up the subject of uh, L-carnosine at this point in time is because uh, I had pointed out that DPP-4 antagonists, a class of drugs that are being used to treat diabetes, type 2 diabetes nowadays, uh, also can cause heart disease. So here we were recommending DPP-4 antagonists to uh, reverse type 2 diabetes. And now uh, I can no longer recommend DPP-4 antagonists. So... uh, we are instead talking about L-carnosine. So we now have L-carnosine that not only uh, increases beta cell mass in some studies, but it also inhibits uh, LDL oxidation. 
Uh, I might uh, also point out that Sambucus, which we recommend to uh, uh, treat colds early on, treat the flu if you catch it really early, um, also inhibits LDL oxidation. So uh, here we have a combination uh, L-carnosine can both increase beta cell mass and inhibit LDL oxidation, uh, thereby reducing uh, the uh, likelihood of heart attacks. Okay, we're going to go on to the first question. This patient says, it has been such a life changer. I think she's talking about my book. And he has normal blood glucose levels almost all the time. I say almost because when playing soccer, his favorite sport, his blood sugar spikes uh, from adrenaline. Any tips on how to manage this? We don't want him to... Uh, to give him fast-acting insulin because of his fast drop off, no, fast drop, drop off after soccer without any extra insulin. Okay, so apparently this is a mother who has a son who's doing well after reading my book, but because of anxiety before a soccer game, his blood sugar goes up. Although later on, hours after the soccer game, his blood sugar um, drops. This is not uncommon. We actually talk about, about it in my book, Diabetes Solution. And um, what we do with kids who have this problem, and also with adults, who have problems uh, of blood sugar elevation when they talk in public uh, or perform. Uh, I, I do this for many performers. We give them a beta blocker and it stops the effect of adrenaline. It's an adrenaline antagonist and uh, we give it to kids before sporting events that raise their blood sugars and they do fine. Um, it's a little short of miraculous. So you have to ask your doctor to provide a rapid-acting beta blocker. The one that seems to be most rapid-acting uh, is propanolol, but there may be a newer one that works even faster or... Uh, whatever, uh, it's, it's great. Uh, use propranolol to prevent blood sugar increases uh, during events that cause anxiety. Um, let's see. I am an anesthesiologist and diabetic. First, I would like to say I cannot thank Dr. Bernstein enough for the guidance. Secondly, my question is about a recent patient that was coming to the operating room for major orthopedic surgery. Hemoglobin A1C was 8.6, which is an average blood sugar of around 250 milligrams per deciliter on the pre-surgery visit. I raised the discussion of whether the case should be canceled until the patient had better glycemic control. Several internists said that it was not necessary. They claimed that the risk factor for, pre for perioperative complications with diabetes was simply being a diabetic and not the degree of control. They felt good perioperative glycemic control was all that was needed, but acknowledged that often this is not done well. Any comments? Well, 
I guess I agree with them. If you keep blood sugars uh, close to normal before the surgery, during the surgery, and during the weeks thereafter, um, you shouldn't have a higher incidence of infections or other complications caused by the diabetes. So... um, That's basically it. Um, There may be a situation that challenges this, but I cannot think of it offhand. I was not overweight when I went low-carb to control blood sugar spikes. I've added fats to keep my weight from dropping. What fats do you recommend? This person probably has not read my book. Um, I do not, I have not been successful at using added dietary fat to foster weight gain. Uh, And I've told the story over and over of how I gave four people. 900 extra calories a day and we did it with um, olive oil and to enhance the taste we gave them uh, we added some Myers dark rum (laughs) and they all loved it so they were very cooperative at taking in the extra calories in six months time not one person gained one pound it takes both insulin and calories and what I and certainly not insulin and glucose or insulin and carbohydrate because then you have uncertainty in your blood sugar control. But rather what I've been recommending in my book and with my patients and it works is insulin plus protein. We increase the dietary protein considerably and are able to increase insulin somewhat, a little bit, moderate amount, not a lot. So we're not dealing with large numbers that give unpredictable blood sugars. We're dealing with moderate amounts of extra protein and moderate amounts of extra insulin. And that works. Would you recommend adding whey protein powder to foods in order to gain weight? Well, first of all, I don't even know if this person is a diabetic. I have to assume that it's only diabetics in their families that are listening to this um, broadcast. Um, And... uh, Again, if you increase protein and insulin, then the whey protein powder is one way of doing it. It's not necessary to use whey protein powder. If you're a vegetarian, on the other hand, and don't want to eat meat or meat products like eggs or cheese, then... Uh, indeed, you're stuck with whey protein powder, but of course, whey protein is a milk protein which is derived from animals, and if your religion uh, allows you to use it, uh, using whey protein and insulin uh, is one way of uh, gaining weight, I guess. Is my new skin problem of moderate and worsening psoriasis connected to diabetes, uh, connected to my diabetes? Well, I've been trying to persuade the medical profession for close to 30 years that people with diabetes almost universally have psoriasis. 
um, close to 100% of the new patients that walk in here to see me already have psoriasis. Most of them developed psoriasis before they developed diabetes. I have not seen any indication, either with my patients or with my own psoriasis, Uh, that it gets worse or better uh, with regard to blood sugar control. Over the past five years, my severely psoriatic fingernails have gotten quite a bit better, nowhere near normal, but not as... uh, frustrating to care for as they had been. So the psoriasis waxes and wanes. It gets better and worse. And I don't think we know what makes it better or worse. I guess if you have some overlying inflammatory condition uh, and uh, inflammatory markers like... uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha or C-reactive protein or whatever go up, maybe your psoriasis will get worse. Um, uh, there's so much, so little that we know about the uh, about predicting the progression of psoriasis, but I don't think it has to do with blood sugars. And that's about all that I can say. It's, it's a shame that my many attempts to publish the strong association of diabetes and psoriasis uh, have been unsuccessful. The ADA refuses to publish that information. Um, And when I contacted a publication of the National Psoriasis Foundation, they said we're interested in psoriasis, not diabetes. So that's, life is frustrating. I have a 30-year-old son who was diagnosed in 2015 with type 1 diabetes. He is severely learning disabled. He takes one basal injection of 2JO 15 units per day and is thriving. His A1C is now 4.9. By the way, 2JO is the Lantus insulin that uh, is highly concentrated Uh, 300 units per cc uh, and was, uh, I guess, devised to um, help cover the high-carbohydrate diet that uh, many diabetes associations are pushing. So to give them smaller shots um, and cover their eating all day long, uh, they they came up with uh, 2JO. Anyway, let's see. If we continue to keep his blood sugars consistent, do you think the honeymoon period will last indefinitely? And do you think only a basal injection is needed? Okay, well, first of all, I don't like 2JO because you can't adjust it precisely because it's so potent. Uh, I also don't like it because it's glargine and therefore there's just... The, the evidence associating glargine insulin with uh, a variety of cancers is just too strong. And since we have other insulins, there's just no reason to use uh, an insulin that's associated with malignancies. Um, but getting down to the real question, uh, keeping blood sugars absolutely normal and level, in my experience, has been associated with perpetuation of the honeymoon period. And um, I've even seen situations where we had a patient in the honeymoon period for years and then for reasons beyond his control, uh, uh, his, uh, he stopped Uh, his low-carb diet, I shouldn't say beyond his control, his wife was pushing him uh, to to eat uh, a lot of carbohydrate because uh, the ADA was recommending it, and his blood sugars went up and the honeymoon period went away. 
So, I've seen extended honeymoon periods with normal blood sugars, and I've seen them disappear when uh, people uh, stop normalizing their blood sugars. Do you see any type 2 diabetics who are thin and underweight? If you are thin, how would you know what type of diabetes you would have? It's a very good question, and quite honestly, uh, when people ask me this, uh, I say to them, what would you do differently if you knew that you had type 1 or type 2 diabetes? differently than we're doing now to normalize your blood sugars. And they'll say, I don't know. <laughs> Probably nothing. Um, I think that the emphasis should be on normalizing blood sugars, not trying to figure out what kind of diabetes you have. Sure, um, people who um, uh, have no uh, history of ketoacidosis, no history of having detected uh, autoantibodies to insulin or GAD or a dozen other um, uh, parts of the beta cells, may, and uh, even if they're not obese, they may be type 2 diabetics, maybe they may be making a lot of insulin. Uh, but they also may be mild type 1 diabetics. And is it really worth uh, the effort trying to figure out uh, what name to put on their diabetes? I've seen many patients who have seen... Uh, chief endocrinologists at major medical centers and universities who were given diagnoses that of one kind of diabetes or another that didn't make sense to me. And it didn't matter anyway because the kind of treatment is dependent upon how the blood sugars react to the treatment, not the name that you put on the disease. For example, I have kids who are clearly type 1 diabetics who, are, who I'm giving metformin because they're insulin resistant because of puberty. Or they may be um, type 1 kids who later became overweight from following the ADA diet and high doses of insulin. And we may be uh, giving them metformin, but they're clearly uh, type 1 diabetics because they were thin when they were diagnosed, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's just a waste of time. You have stated that you intend to begin treating patients who still have beta cells with incretin mimetics, not just as an appetite suppressant, but also to facilitate beta cell recovery or generation or regeneration and then the patient uh, is asking me to comment well I just mentioned that we're no longer recommending the DPP4 antagonists uh, such as um, uh, Genuvia and so on because of the studies that show them uh, associated with heart disease How to get a type 1 10-year-old to gain weight without growth retardation? Well, I'd suggest that you read my book. And you know now, from what I said earlier, what I'll be saying in the book. Namely, insulin plus protein. Uh, you increase his dietary protein and uh, cover it with insulin. And, of cer and certainly you must normalize blood sugars. Uh, diabetic kids who do not have normal blood sugars rapidly fall off their growth curve, and then 
when you return their blood sugars to normal, they return to their growth curves, both for height and weight. Um, next question. 32-year-old type 1 diabetic, diagnosed six months ago. I would like to train for a 200-mile <laughs> bike ride in the summer, but want to do so in a way that keeps my blood sugar as close to normal as possible, as recommended in your book. What is the best way to fuel my rides and restore glycogen while keeping blood sugars at target? Well, first of all, there's a myth that permeates the physical training profession, permeates the medical profession, and uh, namely that you can do something diet-wise to increase your glycogen stores above the normal glycogen stores that your body is capable of uh, making. And the average human of average weight, let's say 150 pounds, can make um, 15, can make 300 grams of glycogen stored in their liver and muscles, and that's it. They cannot make any more. There's no artificial or magical way of storing huge amounts of glycogen. So, if you're going to run a mar marathon, uh, you're going to have to be replacing blood sugar continually. So, uh, what's the best way of doing that? You could be using the small uh, bottles of liquid glucose that I use to treat my blood sugar when it goes low. Uh, uh, each capful of this stuff is one gram of glucose, and you're going to have to do it by trial and error. So uh, every few minutes, you take a little um, uh, slurp of the liquid glucose. Uh, another way would be to carry with you glucose tolerance test drinks, the... Uh, the bottles uh, that they uh, sell for doing glucose tolerance tests. Those are larger bottles, they're heavy, and I don't recommend them. So uh, these are plastic, they're lightweight, and you might uh, fabricate some kind of belt that you put around your waist where you have these things stowed in the belt. Or you can have a, um, one of these big pockets that you put around your waist load it up with these things, and every time you finish one, you throw it away. Um, or you have someone, uh, other people meet you periodically along the way, uh, as they do in uh, formal marathon races, uh, and uh, check your blood sugar and give you glucose. That's the more, much more appropriate way. You should be stopping checking your blood sugar, covering it with glucose. And by doing that, uh, you get an idea of how rapidly you are l using up the glucose that you're drinking. I can't think of any other way. Um, uh, eating protein is not going to work fast enough. Having a lot of protein in advance, it, uh, it'll be sitting in your stomach, uh, and running slows digestion, so that's not going to really help you. You really need pure glucose. I can't think of anything else. Eating um, uh, things like uh, crackers and cookies and stuff like that, that's not going to be fast enough. Um, so that's all I can think of. Which do you prefer and why? Novolin R or Umulin R. Both of these are regular insulin, also called crystalline insulin. Regular insulin is the kind of insulin that I recommend to cover meals. And um, as far as I can tell, Novolin R and Umulin R are identical. They have the same potency, they have the same con they have the same uh, timing, and they're equivalent. You can switch back and forth between one and the other. Now, if anyone wants to do experiments 
and finds out that I'm wrong, please let me know because it's important information. But my patients have been using both of these for 30 years and we can't, we have yet to discern a difference. I have been eating close to your recommendations and found that I have acidity in my urine. Is this something I should be concerned about and what are some recommendations? Well, urine is supposed to be acidic. I don't know why you're testing it for acidity. Um, uh, the acidity is pretty well uh, controlled by the kidneys, but it could be, it could vary with the diet. Um, uh, citrus fruits, for example, might raise the acidity, but uh, what would worry me is if the urine were alkaline, not if it were acid. It's supposed to be acid. I am a type 1 29-year-old female, 5 foot 4 inches tall, and currently weigh 160 pounds. What do you recommend as a goal weight? I currently take about 30 in units of insulin a day. Does that make me insulin resistant? Well, first of all, I would suggest you read my book. Um, uh, one can't just off the bat uh, recommend uh, an ideal body weight. What you can do is try to grab skin fold thickness around the uh, waist. Uh, if the camera sees it right over here, I'm grabbing my skin fold thickness, which is a little under a centimeter. I guess it's maybe a half or three quarters of a centimeter. Um, and uh, none overweight would be about a half centimeter. That means you don't have any ab abdominal fat. And so your ideal body weight probably is to get that down to a half centimeter. Now, what if you're too thin? Uh, again, I'd have to look at you and see. And you could probably tell by looking in the mirror. Or you might ask your friends to look at you. In any event, uh, 30 units of insulin is uh, a lot of insulin for a person as small as you and you currently weigh 160 pounds, which means you're uh, pretty fat. We might even call you obese. So I think you have a long way to go to get your weight down, and you should read my book, because that should be of help. What role should lentils play in a diabetic diet? It should pay, play a zero role. Um, again, uh, if you read my book, you'd see that uh, lentils turn rapidly to glucose when they encounter the amylase in your saliva, just like bread does, and uh, they will rapidly raise blood sugar. I notice in your new book, you still prescribe Actos. What is your opinion of the bladder cancer theory? My recollection is that the later, latest study trying to find uh, a higher incidence of bladder cancer with Actos came up with uh, virtually nothing. Uh, first of all, bladder cancer is very rare. Secondly, the initial reports were that it was increased uh, uh, slightly or moderately, and if you increase something that's close to zero moderately, you're still close to zero. Um, I uh, still use Actos when I have no other options, and my objection to op Actos is not the bladder cancer thing, which uh, looks like it's been negated, but rather the increased rate of fractures, and also the fact that some people experience fluid retention when they take Actos which uh, the, the generic name is pioglitazone. Uh, and when I do prescribe Actos, which can be very effective for lowering insulin resistance, I might also add that this is one of the drugs that's been associated with uh, increasing beta cell mass. So um, 
uh, it m may prevent beta cell burnout. At least there's some studies that suggest this. Uh, the trouble is that it can cause fluid retention, but I, if I have a patient taking Actos, I ask them to press uh, on their tibia, that's a bone in the leg, to see if they have edema. And if they are getting pretibial edema from the Actos, I have them stop, stop it. Not that pretibial edema killed anyone per se, but it uh, increases uh, fluid retention, which can be uh, detrimental if you have chronic venous insufficiency or if you have uh, congestive heart failure and so on. So I just don't want people to have pretibial edema. Otherwise, uh, I have a number of patients who don't get edema from it who are using Actos and find it of great value at keeping blood sugars down. And it facilitates weight loss because uh, you need less insulin, uh, either injected or self-made, if you're uh, using the Actos. Similarly to metformin. What can be done about my diabetic medications, metformin, genuvia, and glipizide, causing chronic di diarrhea? I live on Imodium, that's a, an anti-diarrheal uh, agent. Colonoscopy is negative. Well, I think, first of all, you should read my book, Diabetes Solution. Secondly, um, you might want to get a physician who knows more about uh, medications. Of the various medications that you're taking, the only one that causes diarrhea is metformin. And for some people, um, it's chronic. That is, uh, no matter what you do uh, about how you take the metformin, uh, it will cause diarrhea. That's for some rare individuals. For most individuals, and whenever I start using metformin for somebody, I follow certain rules. One, I don't use generic metformin because it's much less potent uh, at lowering blood sugars than the brand name glucophage. And it's also, the glucophage is more consistent from one uh, batch to the next. That's number one. Number two. If I'm starting someone on metformin, I start them with the time release form, the XR, because that's less likely to cause diarrhea. Not only that, I will give it at the end of a meal, which makes it less likely to cause diarrhea. So uh, then I'll build up the dosing over time gradually, and if you do it slowly, you're less likely to have diarrhea. Whereas if you start rapid-acting metformin and at full dose right away and give it uh, before meals, you have a very high likelihood of causing diarrhea. So you have to use the metformin properly and preferably glucophage. Secondly, I am reluctant to use Genuvia because of its association with heart failure. I certainly will not use glipizide because of a very strong association with uh, uh, heart disease, plus the fact that it can cause hypoglycemia in a less predictable fashion than insulin. With insulin, you know how much each unit of insulin lowers you. With glipizide, because it depends in part on the digestion and when you took it and uh, uh, whether there's any food in your stomach and so on, you can't really predict the effect upon your blood sugar. So I would not use metformin. I would use glucophage. I would use the XR. I'd start very gradually and experimentally, and if the diarrhea doesn't go away, I'd discontinue it. I would not use Genuvia, and I would not use glipizide. Now, um, uh, it's possible that the that Avandia, uh, which is related to the um, 
Actos that we spoke about earlier uh, may be of value, but again, we worry about fractures and also, uh, to a lesser degree than Actos, we worry about fluid retention. Now, there's one more thing that I have to mention if you have diabetes and chronic diarrhea. And that is, and I've mentioned this before, that 25% of diabetics have common variable immune deficiency. And this may involve a deficiency of the antibody or class of antibodies called IgA, immunoglobulin A. And if you have an IgA deficiency, you can get diarrhea just by virtue of having that deficiency, uh, unrelated to other medications. So that's something that has to be double-checked. Uh, well, you could stop the metformin and see if the diarrhea goes away. Uh, and if it doesn't, you should get your IgA levels checked. I have now reached an A1C of 4.1% through diet and exercise, still have a sweet tooth, and eat a significant amount of stevia and erythritol every day. Do you know of any adverse effect caused by eating too much of these sugar substitutes? I've had swollen feet these last weeks and have to get up to pee several times per night. Well, getting up to pee might be due to uh, uh, the erythritol, which is a sugar alcohol that um, can cause edema. Uh, I would think that it's not going to make you pee because it's causing fluid retention, and that may and that may be what caused your legs to swell up. Um, uh, there's one other point to make. Namely that um, erythritol as it is sold in powder form, not the tablet form, but the powder form, contains um, 1% or not, uh, about, uh, yeah, 1% uh, glucose and therefore can raise your blood sugar. And if you're eating large quantities of it all day long, you're going to raise your blood sugar just from the glucose that's in the erythritol. In the tablets, you don't have glucose, so they probably are benign. Uh, the stevia, I doubt, is a problem, but there is also uh, adulterated stevia. Uh, you have to make sure that the stevia you're purchasing is pure stevia and not extract of stevia mixed with a sugar, which is the more commonly sold form. So um, now, if you were using the powdered erythritol and adulterated stevia, your A1C would not be 4.1%, so uh, it might have gone up from there uh, if you're using these contaminated sweeteners. Um, but as I said, the erythritol can be the cause of the uh, swelling in the legs. Now, there are other means of dealing with the craving for sweets. We have several uh, approaches that we're looking at right now. We're testing them out. We have our fingers crossed, and at a uh, future date, if I'm convinced that these approaches are really effective, uh, we will discuss them. And these are approaches that uh, supposedly work for any kind of addiction, not just addiction to sweets. I have, ma I have moderate to severe macular edema being treated with Avastin. Each time I try to exercise, I end up with dark spots in my vision that last a few days and then go away. Is there any sort of exercise you can recommend uh, to avoid the spots? Well, if the dark spots 
are little tiny things like uh, pinheads or like the period at the end of a sentence. They're probably red blood cells. And the exercise is probably causing micro hemorrhages and uh, uh, probably should be changed. Uh, the person to tell you what kind of exercise you can tolerate would be the retinologist who's treating your macular edema. I might, however, point out one thing. I've seen uh, a number of diabetics who come here with a chief complaint of macular edema, and I talk their retinologist into giving me six months uh, in which to normalize their blood sugar and then wait to see what happens. And in each of these cases, the macular edema has reversed. And in each of these cases, the um, retinologist has been astounded, uh, said he's never seen such a thing before. And the reason they've never seen it before is because doctors are not advocating normal blood sugars. Uh, and uh, very few people out there know how to achieve normal blood sugars. So uh, the first treatment for diabetes-caused macular edema should be normal blood sugars. That doesn't mean that I object to the Avastin. The Avastin has been extremely effective and um, may work even if the blood sugars are kept elevated. I'm just not sure. Is excess protein bad, especially if you have diabetes, a myth? Um, we've spoken about this. It's reviewed in my book. In fact, I even have uh, a section in the appendix that's dealing with this. Um, I don't know what excess protein means. I do know that um, for years the American Diabetes Association has promoted high-carbohydrate, low-fat, low-protein diets and caused uh, irreparable damage. Um, I live on a very high-protein diet, and that's what's kept me alive with diabetes for 70 years. That's not my age. I'm 82, but I've had diabetes 70 years, and I would have been long gone if it were not for a high-protein diet. Now, there is some evidence that if you are uh, several months away from dialysis, if your kidneys are almost totally gone, your creatinine clearance is around 5%, maybe less, that uh, if you go on a low-protein diet and s substitute uh, certain medium chain amino acids for the dietary protein, you might put off the uh, dialysis by a few months. Maybe. The evidence is uncertain. But as far as the long-term effects on the kidneys, it's the high blood sugars that cause diabetic kidney disease, not the dietary protein. Uh, it's interesting that the investigator who originally popularized the idea that dietary protein uh, accelerated diabetic kidney disease in mice, five years later did a study where he kept the mice at normal blood sugars, uh, they were diabetic mice, and had no effect. The, the half were on a high-protein diet, half were on normal rat chow, and they were clamped at blood sugars of 90, and none of them got diabetic kidney disease. None of them developed diabetic complications. So the answer is normal blood sugars, uh, certainly not restricting protein. I understand, my understanding is that if one exercises long enough, at some point, muscles exhaust their stored glucose and need more. At this point, 
you're either getting it from food or drink or from gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis would be conversion of protein to glucose, and in this case it would be breaking down your muscles and, co and converting them to glucose. Insulin is still required to utilize the glucose. In other words, if you are exercising beyond that point and don't have enough insulin to utilize the glucose consumed or generated, your blood sugar will rise. Well, the patient didn't ask any questions. And I would suggest that um, uh, he or she read my book, Diabetes Solution. And what we find is that in order for exercise to bring down your blood sugar or not raise your blood sugar, you need a certain amount of insulin. We have no uh, simple way of measuring what your serum le insulin level is while you're exercising. We know for sure that if it's zero, your blood sugar is going to go up. We don't know what level uh, it should be for a given kind of exercise to prevent a blood sugar increase, but insulin is necessary. So either you have to make it yourself or you have to inject it. And... Um, uh, people who take basal insulin injections, like uh, type 1 diabetics who are taking basal insulin, usually have enough basal insulin on board to cover their exercise. But I have some patients who are taking basal insulin, and when they exercise, their blood sugar goes up. So uh, they may ideally have to uh, take added injected insulin to cover the exercise. Or they may not be exercising heavily enough. They may uh, be stimulating their counter-regulatory hormones like uh, adrenaline and cortisol, uh, but not have enough insulin on board to offset those. Uh, and if they exercise more strenuously, uh, exercise will do one thing that ex that insulin does. It moves glucose transporters. If you uh, look at my uh, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University session on glucose transporters where we uh, illustrate um, insulin receptors and glucose transporters, uh, you can see uh, how insulin moves glucose transporters to the sur surface of cells Exercise does the same thing and helps put glucose into the cells. So if you have strenuous enough exercise, you actually do the same thing that insulin does. Next question. Is it safe to have a martini or two in the evening while taking Glucophage XR? I was told that alcohol while on metformin was harmful to the liver. Well, yes and no. Uh, um, metform uh, metformin or glucophage is metabolized by the liver. Uh, if you did not have a liver, the blood levels would keep going higher and higher, and you'd probably eventually get to a toxic level. But when you're taking two drugs that both are metabolized by the liver there's a good chance that blood levels of both drugs are going to go up. So, if you were taking metformin and fluconazole, both of which are metabolized by the liver, chances are that both your serum fluconazole levels and your metformin levels would go higher. Well, alcohol is metabolized by the liver, so you have the same competi competition for the enzymes that metabolize these substances, and yes, there's a good possibility that the blood levels will go up. It's not that you're going to destroy the liver by having alcohol and metformin. It's that uh, you're going to raise blood levels. But there's another problem with having uh, a martini, and that is uh, at meals uh, is 
the most dangerous time for hypoglycemia related to a- alcohol consumption. Uh, again, this is covered in my book, Diabetes Solution, uh, especially if you're injecting insulin to cover a meal. That insulin is covering not just carbohydrate, but also protein. And the liver plays a role in converting protein to glucose. And if the liver is paralyzed and you took insulin for a certain amount of glucose, and then you paralyze the liver with alcohol, your blood sugar is going to go down. You're taking too much insulin, so you'll cause hypoglycemia. Will that also happen with metformin? Metformin's not as potent as lowering blood sugar as insulin is, so the chances are you won't get hypoglycemia, but the only way to find out is to try it. <laughs> so uh, that, that, that's an interesting experiment. Type 2 following your diet on glucophage XR, which is metformin. A1C of 5.2. Would like to get it below 5%. Would Genuvia be an option, even though it increases production of insulin, therefore increases beta cell burnout? Well, uh, if anything, Genuvia has the opposite effect, does not increase beta cell burnout. It will lower blood sugar slightly. Uh, And as I've mentioned previously, there is the slight chance of increasing uh, heart disease. So there is a risk associated with the chronic use of Genuvia. Um, I would, uh, if I had a patient, I would give them the choice of Genuvia or a little bit of insulin um, uh, maybe one sh- shot of uh, one or two units of Traceba per day uh, and let the patient decide, I'd give him the pros and cons of both treatments and let him decide or her. Which is better, Glycet or Acarbos and why? Glycet uh, and Acarbos are both alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. These are substances that stop the enzyme that breaks down complex carbohydrates into glucose. Um, uh, We have uh, amylase in the saliva that does this, but alpha-glucosidase does this in the intestines. And the American Diabetes Association, very interestingly, recommends high doses, high dietary doses of complex carbohydrates, and then says take uh, glycet or acarbose to stop you from digesting them. So it stops you from digesting them, or partially stops it, and then your intestinal bacteria digest them, and you produce methane, which uh, uh, has... uh, what people generally consider an unpleasant aroma. So here you have the ADA getting uh, plenty of advertising income from acarbose and glycet, uh, advocating a high carbohydrate diet so that they can advocate the sales of these products, and then giving you the products to offset the carbohydrate that you're eating. Uh, Neither of them make any sense. You can't say one's better than the other, they're equivalent, and they Both make a lot of methane with the help of bacteria. Do you see any problem with eating two to three ounces of canola or olive oil with each meal as the best way to add calories and help gain weight? Well, I already mentioned that I've never been able to uh, have anyone gain weight by... uh, eating more fat. And we now know from many studies that it's the carbohydrate that puts a lot of weight on, but it also raises blood sugar. And um, if you're diabetic, the key would be protein plus insulin. 
And that's what we advocate in my book, Diabetes Solution. Now, we're at the end of tonight's seminar. I should remind you that the next uh, teleseminar will be on June 29th, 2016. Thank you so much for listening. Take a peek at Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University and you'll get uh, many more answers than we've given you tonight. Lots of luck.